what now about uh, about the analytics area? So we've now we've looked at the community area where there's classroom discussion. We've looked at the creator area um, where. Um, where people have done peer-reviewed projects. By the way, the publisher area is an area where the peer-reviewed projects are set up. You don't need to worry about that. And also the bookstore area is an area where things called learning modules, which, where designs of learning um, are created. But anyhow, um, we're now in the analytics area. And what we have here is yet another class. So you've seen a um, classroom discussion in a school where the grade six students are discussing a bit of Shakespeare. You've seen a peer review of uh, a veterinary medicine clinical analysis, but now you're actually in, in fact in one of Mary and my online um, uh, education classes here in the Learning Design and Leadership Program at the University of Illinois. Um, and here um, we're looking at the analytics area to see what's happening in that particular, uh, that particular space. Uh, and we have a thing here called an Aster plot. By the way, in this course, there are about 50 or 60 students in the course. We're about four weeks into an eight week course. And already the students have reached um, an analytics level of 62. Now I'm gonna explain what's happening in this analytics space, um, um, but I'm gonna explain it in terms of the overall class view but what i want to tell you is that every student has access to this aster plot all the time so in other words i'm showing you that the whole class is up to what we would call 62 percent of the way towards uh, mastery to use the benjamin bloom bloom concept um and but every individual student can see where they're up to some are not at 62 some are at more than 62. and what we've done is we've divided this into three major sectors, three major things that we are valuing. Uh, we're valuing focus, which is the amount of work that you've done. We're valuing knowledge, which is evidence of what you have learned. And we are valuing help, which is your collaborative relationships to others in this particular uh, environment. There are th our three kind of macro categories. And by the way, mastery, our expectations are specified here at the outside. And I'm going to show you these little mouse overs in a second because this is being very specific about these expectations. Down here on the right, we have a, a color coding of all these expectations. But when we mouse over any one of these, we can see um, uh, what, what we're, uh, the data that's coming in. So when I go to um, the average peer review um, uh, rating, um, this is a measure of performance because we've got, you know, we're crowdsourcing this. We've got a rubric in there which is uh, pretty abstract about critical thinking and 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 uh, practicality of what's being said and connections with theory, all that kind of very general abstract stuff. And this is the peer measure um, of um, of uh, each other's each other's uh, qualities of thinking, if you like. So this knowledge method is actually, it looks like a number, but in fact, it's a highly qualitative measure based on collective judgment, okay? What we also have here is a text quality score. Um, uh, we could have had other things in this sector. We've actually bracketed some of them out. I'm gonna show you how that happens in a second, but we can use natural language processing methods to analyze the quality of the text um, as, as an academic text. We go around the other petals, um, help might have been whether you coded your annotations, we've been asking people to do that. That's actually a custom metric that we added in specially. Um, uh, average um, uh, rating, um, what your peers thought of your reviews, that in other words, their, their, their ratings of, uh, of you as a reviewer in the feedback on feedback, um, the average number of annotations on peer works, um, the number of comments you've posted in the classroom discussion, um, the average number of words in the reviews you've authored, which is a crude measure of how much effort you put into it. There's a whole lot of indicators here um, of all these things, and you can see what every one of these, even word length, we say it needs to be 2,000 words, and look, they produced on average 19, 16.12. Not too many and not too few. So some of these are, are, are relatively gross measures. Some of them are quite delicate measures, like what's the collective view of the quality of thinking. Now, here we are only four weeks into an eight week course and already there have been 5,692 metric values on 964,000 
520 data points. Now, I mean, this is actually relatively amazing to actually trace uh, in very finely grained detail everything that's happening in the class, the classroom discussions. We also have surveys in here which can be um, what we call knowledge surveys, which have right and wrong answers, conventional item-based tests, um, or they can be something that we call information surveys, where we just want to survey what you're thinking, what your opinions are, for example. So anyhow, what we've got is this variety of forms of assessment here, and these metric values represent something that we call a semantically legible data point. That's 5,692 small pieces of feedback, which might be one annotation, it might be one block of comment that you've made against a rubric item, it might be one rating, it might be you know, all the stuff that's happening, we're collecting a view of that, but every one of these metric values is a semantically legible data point. It can, uh, and by that we mean it actively contributes in a small way to improving your learning by giving you feedback on the fly while you're learning. But in fact, our machine is looking at 964,000 data points only four weeks in to come up with this score. So this is a very good example of uh, small data becoming big data. It's not intrinsically big data, it's only big data because of the granularity of the collection that we're able to do in this particular, uh, in this particular environment. Now let me just show you what can be done from an admin point of view. These are the admin settings and this is where all the weightings are set up, where our expectations um, as the instructor are, 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 are established. Firstly, we can establish sector weights, which is what are we, um, you know, how do we want to weight the focus and the help and the knowledge sector? Our default is that they're evenly, um, they're evenly uh, weighted, but in fact, you could say, I don't care about collaboration, I'm going to leave that out. I just want to know about how hard they've worked and, and, and the knowledge that they've acquired. You could you can do didactic pedagogy of an old-fashioned variety in this space if you want to, uh, although we suggest that you do a more balanced pedagogy. So the focus metric settings, what we can do is we can go down, change the weight of each setting, which is actually the comparative width of the petal, and charge the value, which is what's being counted to reach the outer edge of the petal. Right. So the outer edge of the petal is 100, which is instructor expectations. Help metric, again, we can uh, we can go through all of those and we can, we can edit what appears in the mouse over because we might want to be specific about that in particular um, learning settings and the knowledge metric settings as well there. Again, we can go through, these are all measurable things and of course we can add new metrics, we can add custom metrics of our own in addition uh, to the ones that are offered here in the system. Now, I want to go back here to this Asta plot once again um, and say something about, uh, or connect this with, with uh, the whole uh, universe of uh, mastery learning. And that is um, that this here is instruct, this outside perimeter, which is 100, is instructor expectations. And the mastery argument is this. The mastery argument is this, that if every learner can see what the expectations are, they can meet those expectations. They can actually work towards those expectations. And in fact, what we can do is we can say, look, you know, 80 is an A, right? Once you've reached 80, you might have exceeded 80 on some um, on some pedals. You mightn't have got to 80 on others. More work on some pedals could compensate for less work in other places, for example. And we give control of the assessment process to a greater degree than it's ever been possible in the past to the students. Now, research into the work that Benjamin Bloom did has shown us that, in fact, um, uh, it's very hard to do mastery learning in conventional learning environments. Can you afford the the, the, the extra tutor? How do you manage group work? Um, it's actually very hard to achieve those results and probably expensive. But one of our arguments is that we can do something which couldn't have been imagined uh, back in 1968 when uh, Benjamin Bloom and his colleagues were first thinking through these ideas. By providing access to the data, we can both show to the, the, the teacher where every individual student are, is on their route towards mastery. We can do that, but also what we can do is empower them to some degree by showing them their progress, by actually showing them what more they need to do to reach the expectations which in broad brushstrokes have been determined by the, uh, the, by the teacher or the professor.